King Urkel II was born on the 7th of November of 1720. He was the son of Tamaruz II, king of the tiny Georgian kingdom of Kakheti. His mother was named Tamar of Kartli, daughter of the king of the neighboring Kartli, a kingdom which she would inherit from him in 1744 and become Tamar II. From a young age, this prince of two different kingdoms' destiny in life would be to unite the two kingdoms after the eventual death of his parents. The young prince was born to serve the Persian Shah as well, as his future kingdoms fell under the domain of the Safavid Persian Empire and their Shah. The Persian Empire was not only different culturally from the small Georgian kingdoms, but was also different in the matter of religion. The Safavids were founded on the Sufi sect of Shia Islam, while Georgia was part of the Eastern Orthodox Church, far separated from other Christians. These factors made the Georgian kingdoms maintain a sense of nationalism, and they enjoyed a great deal of autonomy. They were still required to send their soldiers to the Shah for military campaigns. This can be seen as the 14-year-old Prince Urkel could be found in the armies of Nader Shah, commanding a small auxiliary force of Georgians in a North Indian campaign, fighting the large but weakening Mughal Empire. By 1740, he had returned to his Georgian home, and just in time too, because his father had just been called to Persia to discuss the state of his client kingdom. By 1744, Urkel's cousin, the anti-Persian Abdullah Beg, took the opportunity of the absent King Tamaruz II to overthrow him. Abdullah Beg hired mercenaries and local support and was able to capture the capital of Tbilisi. Urkel, who was already an experienced commander, easily recaptured his city and secured his path to the throne. It is unknown what came of Abdullah Beg, but we can only assume that it was not pretty. For crushing this anti-Persian coup, it gained him loyalty with Nader Shah, who ordered that, by eliminating this anti-Persian threat, he would make him the king of Kakheti in place of his father. His father, in 1744, would now become the king of Kartli with his wife. Now Urkel was a king, a king caught between three different worlds of a modernizing Russia, a controlling Persian empire, and a looming Ottoman threat. Urkel II ruled the best that he could, even as a tributed vassal of the Persians, until 1747. In 1747, Nader Shah would be beat and murdered by a group of assassins in his tent one night. This assassination would lead King Tamaruz II and King Urkel II to seek independence. This conflict would come to a head in 1751, outside a little village named Kirkakula. An army of 18,000 Persians had come to restore their vassalage over the two Georgian kings. King Urkel would be the one to fight this invading army. He set up a defensive position at the village of Kirkalak to take advantage of the narrow pass that he could use to bottleneck the overwhelming Persian force with his handful of only 3,000 soldiers. When the battle starts, King Urkel orders for his cavalry to all dismount and orders his musketeers to not fire until his command came but it would come too late and the Georgian forces would be encircled. The number one rule of military school is to not allow yourself to be encircled, but Urkel had voluntarily done this in order to lure the enemy general to within range of his musketeers. Then on his signal, the whole army made a mad dash to the direct center of Azad Khan's army, under the cover of a devastating volley of musket balls. One of these projectiles would find its target and kill Azad Khan in one volley. The now leaderless and confused Persians were no match for the brave and highly disciplined 3,000 Georgian soldiers. The numerically weak force broke the Persian will to fight within minutes, and soon they started an unorganized retreat back through the narrow pass that they came through. Many of them struggled and were trampled by their fellow Persian soldiers. The ones who did escape had little luck, as Urkel's cavalry was ordered to be remounted and to chase the remaining foes. This heroic and unorthodox Spartan-like defense protected the two Georgian kingdoms and secured their independence for the first time in decades. Then, it wasn't a matter of would the Persians reconquer them, it was just a simple matter of when would they decide to reconquer them. In response to this, both Urkel and his father would constantly try to seek a military alliance with their neighboring country of Russia. Russia would hold out on the allegiance though, even as Kakheti and Kartli had won their independence. With Russia not wanting an alliance, it was now time to look for more local allies. So they aligned themselves with their Azerbaijani neighbors, who had long faced harsh treatment under Nader Shah. About 15 years after the two Georgian kings had won their independence, Urkel's father and the king of Kartli would die in St. Petersburg, while trying to gain a military alliance with Russia. This left his kingdom of Kartli under the domain of his son now. Urkel II would start to wear both of these crowns in 1762. Then Urkel would continue his father's lifelong work of trying to gain a military alliance with Russia. See, Georgia is an orthodox Christian nation that is very much so on the peripheries of the Christian world. An alliance with Russia would help connect this tiny kingdom to the modernizing Christian countries of Europe. In an effort to try to gain this alliance, King Urkel II decided to help Russia in the Russo-Turkish War of 1768 to 1774. 
In 1769, Urkel's 3,000 men joined with the Russian expeditionary force led by General Totlebin. And for the first time, Russia and Georgia would team up. Which is why it is unfortunate that the two generals did not get along well. See, the Russian General Totlebin was a more logistical-styled commander who preferred long, drawn-out siege warfare rather than open battle. So after some insults that consisted of King Urkel II calling the general a coward, he split the two armies and took his 3,000 men to fight the Ottoman Turks alone as General Totlebin withdrew. And it didn't take King Urkel long to find the 10,000 strong army of Turks. The outnumbered and outgunned Georgians once again beat back a superior army by once again killing their general and then routing the army. At the head of a triumphal parade, King Urkel returned to his capital of Tbilisi. Well, this is what he would have done if General Totlebin had not taken the city of Tbilisi while he was away on campaign. See, this really made Urkel mad, who had single-handedly protected Russia's Caucasian border with the Ottomans and had nothing to show for it. After occupying his city for a few months, General Totlebin was relieved of his duties by a most likely disappointed Catherine the Great, who didn't want to annex the tiny kingdom of Georgia. In 1771, he returned to his capital, angry at Russia, but with no hope of an alliance with anyone else but Russia. A few years later, in 1783, with the Treaty of Georgia Vesk, he gained Russian protection as the Kingdom of Kartli Kakatan became a protectorate, or what amounts to an autonomous vassal of Russia. Unsurprisingly, in 1787, Russia would not hold up their end of the deal as a new Russo-Turkish war started. When this war started, all Russian troops stationed within Kartli Kakheti were to withdraw, leaving behind the kingdom to be exposed to the Ottomans once again. This would once again force Urkel II to look for more closer allies. So in 1790, he became part of an assembly of kings that featured the king of Imerati, Mingarelli, and Guria. These four kings declared that all of us are blood relatives of one religion and one language, therefore uniting the four kingdoms from all outside aggression. The 70-year-old King Urkel II was then chosen to be the father of all these new lands, uniting the Caucasian people for the first time in over 300 years. But this 1790 treaty came too little, too late, and the kingdoms could never unify enough to become a serious threat to its much stronger neighbors. Five years later, in 1795, Persia started to reconquer King Urkel's land and demanded his submission to become a Persian governor once again. And once again, he would refuse. The king would meet the 40,000 strong Persian army outside his capital on the plains of Christianissa. He was met there by the loyal king of Imerati and his 2,000 soldiers. Combined, they were only 5,000 strong, outnumbered 8 to 1. Urkel was always outnumbered, but never this bad. This still did not seem to bother the 75-year-old Urkel II, who led from the front lines along with his cousin Solomon II of Imerati. The battle would decide the fate of these two kingdoms, and it would be nothing short of a bloodbath. The Georgians hacked their way through the Persians with ease, killing thousands with swords and artillery. During the battle, the Persian Shah, Aga Muhammad Khan, saw an opening. So he crossed the nearby river and led his cavalry into the exposed Georgian flank. The elderly Urkel II caught them before he could reach the flank, charging his own cavalry into that of Persia. Now King would face King on the battlefield as the Persian cavalry seemed to swallow the small contingent of Georgian cavalry. The old king disappeared for a time, as the Persian cavalry successfully ran through the Georgian cavalry and moved on to the bulk of the Georgian infantry. The battle was all but lost now, but the Georgians never stopped fighting, killing waves and waves of Persian soldiers. It's at this point that King Urkel II would re-emerge, soaked in the blood of his enemies, with a few of his bodyguards remaining in close pursuit of him. He moved to his artillery unit, which managed to briefly keep the Persian horde at bay. To continue to fight the Persians at this point would only mean suicide, but the now fanatic old king had to be dragged away from the battlefield by his own bodyguards. The remaining artillerymen then held the Persians off, while King Urkel II was dragged away by the remainder of his 150 men. The king had finally lost the battle, but not before killing 13,000 Persian soldiers, but at the cost of his own 4,000 men. Now he would be forced into the woods of his own country, waiting for the response of his unreliable Russian ally. Finally, after the king's 76th birthday had passed him, King Urkel received 40,000 troops under the direction of General Valerian Zubov, who helped him to liberate his kingdom. When a new Tsar came to the throne, Valerian was recalled to Russia, leaving Urkel behind with an exposed and looted kingdom. And soon, in the following year, Aga Muhammad Khan raised another army to try to take Georgia. This conquest would be much easier this time, as there is barely a Georgian army to beat, but King Urkel did not surrender, even as Persia reinvaded his land. 
This old king had one more trick up his sleeve. He intended to cut the head off of Aga Muhammad Khan from the Persian snake. One night a commotion was started near the Shah's tent. This displeased the Shah, who ordered the two men that were making the ruckus to be executed. The Georgian and Persian born men were then chained, but an emir who was close to the Shah protested that it was a holy Islamic day and the two could not be executed. He then agreed to have the two men executed the following day. This would be the Shah's last mistake, as the two men killed their future killer in the night with cloak and dagger. Whether these two men were aligned with King Urkel or not, they had just saved his kingdom from total destruction. A year later, the 77-year-old king would die of old age, after being king for a total of 54 years. He would be succeeded by his son, George VII, who would die a short three years after Urkel. Then after this, Russia would betray Georgia for the final time and annex Kartli Kakheti in that same year, throwing the lifelong diplomatic work of King Tehamuraz II and his son, King Urkel II, straight into the trash. King Urkel was the model for the warrior king. For his long life, he represented the last breath of Georgian independence, which seemed to live and die with his watchful and caring eye. Truly a hero to his people.